sulfated glycosamine or glycans, which we can call GAGs, become depleted in sulfate when they are chronically exposed to glycosate. And we explain how that happens here, but I think I will go into some of that more later on in this, in this talk. So just the big picture on glyphosate is the active ingredient in the herbicide Roundup. Um, it's pervasive in the food supply. It's considered to be safe for people, but there's increasing doubt that this is true. It kills weeds by suppressing an enzyme in the shikimate pathway, which is called EPSP synthase. And um, our gut bacteria also have this enzyme and, they, and the pathway, and they use it to make essential aromatic amino acids for the host. So they, these become deficient when that pathway is blocked in the bacteria, and also the bacteria become sick, and you get dysbiosis and imbalance in the gut and all kinds of problems. Um, there's a strong, there are strong correlations between the rise in glyphosate usage in the United States in, and the rise in a, a huge list of neurological, oncological, autoimmune, and metabolic diseases. And you can look at this paper by Nancy Swanson et al. from 2014, and they have 26 uh, graphs in there. Many of them are showing uh, extremely strong correlations between a whole list of diseases and the rise in glyphosate usage over time. And that rise is due to the introduction of the GMO Roundup Ready crops in the late 1990s. And then uh, later on, they figured out they could use glyphosate as a desiccant on the non-GMO crops. And so they became contaminated as well. The wheat and the oats and the barley and the chickpeas are all highly contaminated, even though they're not GMO crops. Uh, this is my book, Toxic Legacy. It was released in 2021 by Chelsea Green. It, it presents extensive data on glyphosate toxicity to animals and humans. And I should say papers are coming out so fast and furiously these days, I can't keep up. Lots of people are realizing there's something very fishy about this molecule and it's much worse than we had realized. Um, so the, paper, the book shows how it interferes with sulfate homeostasis. And it argues that glyphosate is insidiously cumulatively toxic through its diabolical uh, insertion into proteins by mistake in place of the coding amino acid glycine. This is a center, it centers the book. Um, and I believe this is happening. It's a very controversial, uh, chemists are denying that it's possible. So we have a disagreement there. But I think if it's true, it explains the, uh, the unique diabolical aspect of glyphosate and how one chemical could cause so many uh, diseases. So here's sort of a schematic of what I'm proposing. What if glyphosate can insert into proteins by mistake in place of glycine? This is the famous DNA code. Every amino acid has a code. In fact, glycine, the code for glycine is GGX. So this uh, third place can be all of the four nucleotides. It has four different codes that work for glycine. So here we have one of those codes showing up. The, the protein is being assembled. We've put together these two amino acids. We're about to put, put the third one in. And it sees glyphosate, this is a glycine molecule, glyphosate fits perfectly into the slot, but it has this extra material over here that gets, can get in the way if, if, it, if there's crowding, but in certain situations, if there's room for it, glyphosate goes in and then it gets indirectly inserted into the protein. And this might abort the entire synthesis at this point because you can't put the next one on because of the glyphosate, or it just might produce a protein that's defective. And if this glyphosate sits on a glycine, that is extremely important for this protein, which there are many, many proteins that have extremely essential glycine residues, the glyphosate can ruin that protein and make it unable to do its job. And so it turns out this is a very good story for what's happening with EPSP synthase. And multiple species of bacteria and multiple species of weeds have developed resistance to glyphosate by swapping out a crucial glycine residue in the enzyme EPSP synthase in the shikimate pathway, replacing it with alanine. So once you re replace that glycine, at the place where EPSP synthase binds phosphoenolpyruvate, um, the, uh, if you replace that glycine with alanine, which is one extra methyl group, uh, glyphosate's dead in the water. It can't have any effect on that, on that version of the protein. And that's the basis for the GMO crops. So glyphosate kills plants by suppressing EPSP synthase. It blocks the synthesis. It blocks its binding to, this, to the phosphate in phosphoenolpyruvate. And it is a glycine molecule. It has this extra methylphosphonate unit. This is a methylphosphonate over here. And this is phosphate. And you can see these two are very, very similar. So this fits in the place wh which was reserved originally for the, for the phosphate in PEP. Glyphosate puts its phosphate there, phosphonate there. And then the PEP can't get close. So the uh, enzyme doesn't work. And so, and so this all, all makes sense to me. So many enzymes that glyphosate has been shown to suppress contain what I call a glyphosate susceptibility motif, which is that they bind phosphate at a site where there is at least one highly conserved glycine. And this turns out to be the case for many very, very important proteins. 
and in fact, many proteins that are involved in the deuterium uh, management. So um, I got interested in sulfate very early on with respect to autism. I figured that sulfate was impaired. Sulfate management was impaired in autism. I figured that out before I even knew about glyphosate, just from reading the autism literature. And, um, and so when I discovered glyphosate, I looked to see whether, and it turns out, I think it's very convincing that glyphosate is in fact impairing sulfation systemically. And sulfation is a very important um, thing that happens to many, many different biologically active molecules in order to transport them and deliver them to their destination. And so this is just showing two steps in the, in the sulfate system. Here you have sulfate, SO4 minus two, negatively charged four oxygen bound to a sulfur. Um, PAPS synthetase is a very important enzyme that converts sulfate to PAPS. And PAPS is sort of the universal sulfate donor. It's the activated form of sulfate. It contains an ATP molecule and it contains phosphate for that reason. And this enzyme both um, needs two, it binds to two ATP molecules and one of them it converts into PAPS and the other one it uses for energy. So it's got lots of places where it binds um, phosphate at sites where glycine is highly conserved. This makes it vulnerable to glyphosate. And the same thing over here with sulfur transferases, they also bind phosphate at sites where glycine is highly conserved. They actually take the sulfate off of PAPS and they deliver it to all kinds of biologically important molecules. Um, cholesterol and its various derivatives, the, the hormones, you know, um, thyroid hormone and, and um, um, dopamine and serotonin and melatonin and, um, and vitamin D and uh, cholesterol, they're all sulfated in transit. And also many, uh, many toxins are detoxed through sulfation. So when this is broken, especially when this sulfur transferase is broken, there's a lot of problems through systemically as a consequence of not being able to sulfate these molecules. So here's just showing all these different sulfur transferases from various animals and various forms, um, you know, rats and mice and humans, guinea pigs. Um, they all have this, this sequence, GXX, GXXK, this motif, which has these two glycines. And that's at the, at the place where it binds phosphate. And so here we have um, sulfur transferases are crucial to attach sulfate anions to multiple bioactive molecules, the steroids, I mentioned all of these, the, uh, the sex hormones, vitamin D, chondroitin sulfate, heparin sulfate in the glycosaminoglycans, polyphenols and aromatics. And these are some of these important nutrients, curcumin, resveratrol, tryptophan, which is an aromatic amino acid, neurotransmitters. So all of these things are sulfated in transit. And if these sulfur transferases are broken, that's gonna be a big problem. For, for transporting and delivering these molecules. Um, so this gets into some of the uh, sulfate related to autism story, uh, the role of heparin sulfate deficiency in autistic phenotype by, these, uh, by this author, these authors here, 2016. Um, and so they talked about ASD, autism, autism spectrum disorder, second most common developmental cause of disability in the United States. Um, the autistic brains are unusual because they have too many dendritic spines and too few long distance connections. That's the synapses here, long distance connect connections. They have too many of these spines. Um, heparin sulfate in the brain ventricles plays a crucial role in neurodevelopment and it regulates the uh, guidance of the axons and the dendritic spine formation. And then heparin sulfate deficiency results in excess spine formation, which is what you see in autism. And in autism, you also see uh, Heparin sulfate, you see both the heparin sulfate deficiency and the expected consequence of that, which is too many dendritic spines. This is a fabulous paper published in 2021. I was so delighted to see this paper because it confirmed what I was suspecting. And Rosemary Waring was a researcher who had worked with autistic kids in the 1990s, and she was proposing um, a defect in the ability to add sulfate to the phenols. Uh, in the gut, decreased phenol sulfur transferase activities. This is exactly what she was saying way back then. She didn't have proof, but she had seen evidence from the urinary samples from the autistic kids and she had a hypothesis that she turned out to be right, that they can't uh, easily add sulfate to these phenolic compounds. And some of them are toxic products from the microbes, such as picresol. I and mean, when you can't add sulfate to it, it becomes very toxic. Um, and then, so, so this uh, paper though, 2021, uh, they actually looked at the gut, the blood, and the brain uh, post-mortem. So remarkably, they had these data. I'm only showing the data on the pineal glands, the, the pineal glands from these autistic kids after they had died. And um, they compared them to controls. They had 22 controls in nine autistic kids. Here you can see heparin sulfate, the amount in the pineal gland 
is much, much higher. It's almost none in the autistic kids, which is quite remarkable. And then this is the enzyme that adds sulfate to heparin sulfate. It's a sulfotransferase for heparin sulfate. And again, the autistic kids had very low um, p-value, very strong, very low levels of activity of this enzyme compared to the control. So I think this is really, really striking. Uh, results that kind of confirms my theory that I've been saying for quite some time about the sulfation problem in autism. Um, the third ventricle is depleted in heparin sulfate in association with autism in both humans and mice. And these are a couple of papers, one for the humans, one for the mice. And this is just sort of a picture of this third ventricle. These are these uh, waterways. The cerebrospinal fluid is inside these ventricles in the brain and then the pineal gland. And so the heparin sulfate was depleted in here the pineal gland is located right here. So it had se severely depleted heparin sulfate in the last slide. It's all consistent because the pineal gland actually provides sulfate attached to melatonin uh, at night to, to get you to sleep. So that melatonin you know, enables sleep. It's, it's shipped into the cerebrospinal fluid attached to sulfate. And that sulfate, I suspect, gets delivered to the glycocalyx in here to help supply the heparin sulfate to the, to the brain ventricles, which is much needed for the uh, development of the brain. Okay, so dissimilatory sulfate reduction is induced by glyphosate. And this is sort of um, based on enzymes. There's a, a wonderful experiment here that I've consulted a lot where they have uh, long tables of enzymes that are suppressed, proteins that are suppressed by glyphosate. And this can help you in, in E. coli. They exposed E. coli to glyphosate and they looked at the suppression of many different proteins. And some that they found uh, were involved in assimilatory sulfate reduction in E. coli. And what that means is you're taking a sulfate uh, ion ion, which is, which is um, uh, inorganic sulfur, and you're converting it into methionine, which is organic sulfur. And methionine is a, a very important amino acid, a sulfur-containing amino acid, the base of the sulfur-containing amino acid system, because it can be turned into cysteine and taurine and these other sulfur-containing amino acids. But methionine is also the universal methyl donor, so you'll get uh, problems with methylation pathways as well, as well this deficiency in methionine. But at the same time, because the assimilatory sulfate reduction is not working, <laughs>